Hello and welcome everybody. I'm Karen Momba, Publisher for Professional Learning and Development at Cambridge University Press and I'm delighted to introduce our speaker for this session, Silvana Richardson. Silvana has over 30 years of educational experience as a teacher, teacher educator, academic manager, materials writer and consultant. She is currently Head of Education at Bell Educational Services, Academic Director of Bell Teacher Academy Cambridge and Programme Quality Manager at the Bell Foundation. As if three jobs aren't enough, Sylvana is also a guest lecturer on English as an Additional Language at the Faculty of Education, Cambridge University. She is co-author of the Cambridge paper, Effective Professional Development Principles and Best Practice, and is currently authoring a book on the topic. Today, Sylvana is going to talk about the importance of supporting teachers in their learning during and beyond the transition back to classroom teaching and the key role of compassionate learning communities. There will be an opportunity for questions at the end of the talk, so please write any questions for Sylvana in the Q&A box. Thank you, and over to you, Sylvana. Thank you very much, Karen, and uh, hello, everybody, and thank you for being here, and welcome to this webinar. Um, I would just like to begin by sharing with you a couple of facts and figures about the current situation. I'd like you to read them, so I'm not going to say anything for the next minute. So don't you worry if you don't hear me speak. Um, you don't have to, you don't need to write in the chat, sorry, there's no audio, there is no audio intentionally. So I'm not going to be silent for a minute and let you read. Are you ready? Thank you. How can we offer teachers support and solace in the midst of so much uncertainty? This webinar is an attempt to answer, my personal attempt to answer this question. So uh, this webinar will be in three parts. Uh, to understand how to support teachers, first we need to understand the impact of COVID on school communities. Then I'm going to focus briefly on the pursuit of teacher well-being as one of the possible answers to, you know, how, we, how can we support teachers. And the third part is about my answer, which is around building and sustaining teacher learning communities. So let's get started with the impact of COVID on school communities. As you know, um, the closure of schools as a result of the lockdown, which was generated by the pandemic, um, basically triggered uh, a, a, a kind of dis, uh, dis, dissolution of, of um, schools and of, schools commu of school communities, i.e. people who usually work together in the same place at the same time had to uh, be dispersed into their own homes and to work remotely. So what happened was that, um, you know, buildings, brick and mortar buildings were replaced by um, virtual classrooms, virtual learning environments and virtual 
um, staff rooms as well. And I think a really important question to ask ourselves is how effectively has video conferencing software, the, the types of video conferencing software that we used, um, actually allowed us to recreate those very socially close school communities that we had during the pandemic uh, lockdown. And uh, as far as I'm concerned and the subject of this talk, for me, it's really important to look at the staff rooms and the impact on staff rooms. Um, so to actually ask this question in a different way, to what extent did we succeed in recreating the spaces of togetherness that we usually have in a staff room and in our school in virtual? Uh, environments and classrooms. And I want to focus on and I want I would like you to think about these questions in, in your own setting and what your own experience has been. So for example, to get things done, you know, when we move to a virtual staff room, was it equally good um, to get things done? Like, I don't know, at your head teacher or a head teacher or um, the director of studies giving teachers instructions about what to do. How about relating to one another? Um, how about sustaining the typical rituals and routines that makes my school a unique place to work? And you see there a crossword because it's an example of my school, the school where I work and what we do. And, and one of our rituals of bonding and of relating to one another as teachers in a more informal way is that come lunchtime, 10, 12 teachers all gather together around a couple of tables to do the crossword, the guardian crossword. Um, and finally, how, you know, how were we able to learn from and with each other? So now I'm going to ask Eve to uh, put a poll up and um, I'm going to ask the same question. To what extent did we succeed in recreating these spaces of togetherness? And um, regarding the four points, getting things done, um, relating to one another, sustaining rituals and learn from each other. So it would be great if you can, after you think for a second, um, Try and uh, give me your answers to, to these questions. Thank you. Um, Eve, I can't see the results. Is there a way I can see the results? I can see the poll, but not the results. We'll just let them uh, answer, then I'll uh, end the poll. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, fantastic. So I'm going to be silent for a minute and let you vote. So just a reminder that there are four different dimensions to answer the question, to what extent did we succeed in recreating spaces of togetherness in virtual staff rooms to get things done, to relate to one another, to sustain rituals and routines like the example I gave you, and uh, to learn from and with each other. In other words, to engage in continuing professional development. If you let me know when you're ready to display the results, Eve, that would be great. Thank you. Oh, I can see them now. Fantastic. So getting things done. It looks like the winner here is OK on the whole. 37% of you answered this. To what extent did we succeed in recreating spaces of togetherness? Interestingly, the majority, it's a bit, yeah, it's a bit of a 50-50 um, almost, but the majority of you say not so well. Um, in terms of uh, routines and rituals, again, the winner is not so well with 36% of you saying that we didn't really succeed very well in creating spaces of togetherness for this. And finally, um, learning from and with each other, the, were, the majority says 35% of you says um, okay on the whole. And I would thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to close uh, this voting. And I have to say, I entirely agree with you. I entirely agree with you. And this is exactly um, what I was uh, noticing. So um, this is different 
in, in many different parts of the world, uh, you know, schools are beginning to open again or not, et cetera, et cetera, as we saw in the facts and figures. But for those of us um, who are going back to our physical schools and our physical communities, uh, the reality is not the same as the pre-pandemic, as we know. So, for example, um, in the UK where I live, some teachers and some um, um, students and classes have gone back uh, since June and July. My school opened in August. And one of the first things to notice is, of course, social distancing. Uh, so uh, let me show you uh, of what that looks like in my school, you know, what the new normal looks like in my school. So what we have is very small class sizes in large classrooms precisely to preserve social distancing. And you also see socializing in the canteen in pretty much the same way. Now, this also applies to um, the staff room. So now we have socially distant staff rooms. So where you used to have 25, 50 different teachers at any one point, you have to have much, uh, you know, a much lower number of teachers. So what we're getting now is, an, if you like, an enforced reduced togetherness to do exactly the same things and perform the same functions that we were talking about before. And I agree with you, even coming back to a physical school, um, we're still seeing an impact in terms of how we can relate to one another and how to sustain those rituals and routines, you know, both the classroom rituals and routines, but also the staff room rituals and routines. So these for me are the key things. We're still getting things done. We have to do things in a different way, but hey, we're doing it. We're learning it. We, we are getting on with it because that's what we do. Um, we're still learning from each other. And if you think about how disruptive the whole lockdown process was that some schools didn't even have any time to to prepare for the change and yet teachers totally rose to the challenge and learned a lot um, so we're learning in spite of everything um, but you know relating to one another is fundamentally different and sustaining rituals and routines is fundamentally different that's why trying to understand the answer to this question is so important and for you know uh, educational managers leaders etc to try and think about this uh, the answer to this question is fundamental i'm going to repeat it how can we offer teachers support and solace in the midst of so much uncertainty so some academic managers some publishers some teacher educators have um basically focused on this, a possible and very popular answer, I would say, which is to focus even more on the pursuit of teacher well-being. So let's have a look at this, teacher well-being as the answer. Why do I say even more? Because well-being has been um, a major topic, I would say, you know, not um, for, for the last two years. And let me show you um, a, just as, as a way to illustrate this. Um, this is before the pandemic. I attended two conferences between January and March this year. And um, looking at the conference topics, there you are. Um, these are sessions that had topics related to well-being. So mindfulness for stress, well-being and resilience, recognizing, avoiding and dealing with burnout for you and your team, um, you know, well-being in the making, identifying sources of happiness, introducing positive psychology. And you may be wondering why those two asterisks there. Those asterisks uh, indicate that these were plenary sessions. So what we're saying is that well-being is not just the topic of a little poorly attended session. Um, it's it's plenary is this really keynote majorly attended sessions so really important focus and of course it's because there is a lot of burnout uh, among teachers and there is a lot of need for well-being among teachers so this is a genuine and an important concern and much more so since the pandemic there's absolutely no argument about that and this is an, an illustrative um, statement from a colleague of mine at work by the way i will be showing you um, some some slides from colleagues, uh, because I asked colleagues in my organization, teachers to tell me um, why they wanted to learn, how they learned, what helped them, in what configurations, what activities, what types of professional development really mattered to them and helped them. Um, and Anna says here, uh, you know, I went to the several sessions on teacher well-being and resilience, and I appreciated the ideas given and the reassurance. It was important to me to feel that I, what, what I was doing, you know, she was already doing what they were suggesting. So you see that uh, for many teachers, this is really an important topic to focus on. But 
Um, there's also a, a sense that uh, well-being is also a little bit of a buzz um, and a little bit of a fad in some quarters. And equally, and I would say this is the majority of the colleagues that I consulted are saying, things like this. Not all teachers find the warm and fuzzy well-being approach useful and I'm one of them. I think most teachers know how to support themselves and what they really need are practical solutions. And another voice, Claire, another colleague. Um, the webinars I like are those that offer practical classroom teaching ideas. I'm not into mindfulness per se or learning about teacher burnout, but I understand it is a reality in many colleagues' lives. So I'm not going to uh, read this um, uh, this thing here now. But what I'm going to say is that sometimes teachers are uh, a little bit suspicious about that fad around well-being, particularly when organizations talk the talk but don't necessarily walk the walk. In other words, when teachers feel that there is a lot of talk of well-being, there are sessions about well-being, but then the systems, um, the procedures, and the way that teachers are treated, the time they're given, uh, etc., does not reflect that emphasis on well-being. And to uh, finish uh, this, this focus on, on well-being, I wanted to share with you a blog post from um, Philip Kerr's Adaptive Learning in ELT that was called Teacher Wellbeing, Always Look on the Bright Side. And uh, what Phil says is that um, approaches to well-being draw on insights on positive psychology. And, um, you know, positive psychology has been critiqued in some quarters because it chooses to focus on happiness or, or well-being rather than more social and systemic issues. So rather than being, you know, solidarity um, and, and it articulates an underlying individualism and a very narrow sense of the social, of social concern of what really matters to us as a community, et cetera, et cetera. So going back to our question, how can we offer teachers support and solace in the current conditions? Um, the answer of well-being is take care of yourself as an individual. Now, this is absolutely necessary, but I would argue it is not sufficient. Because if the problem is socially distant staff rooms and enforcing this reduced togetherness that affects the way we relate to each other, it affects our rituals, it affects our routines, and ultimately it affects the quality of the teaching and learning. Yesterday I was reading a report that was recently published here in the UK and um, by um, the, uh, the National Foundation on Educational Research, and it said that actually uh, these social distancing measures have had an, a negative impact on the quality of teaching and learning because they basically disrupt those routines and rituals that teachers have in their classrooms. So if this is a problem, then um, an individualistic focus on myself and what I can do to be happy cannot be the only solution. Of course, it's one of the solutions. Of course, it's very important, as I said before, but it cannot just be the only solution. And if we think about um, that many teachers have been teaching in isolation in their homes for about in some in some countries for more than six months, in other countries for less, but pretty much, you know, for half a year. And all those needs for connection and uh, intellectual connection and professional connection as well are not being equally met by, um, you know, remote teaching and learning, remote uh, teacher learning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, then ongoing teaching support is crucial. The other thing to say is that maintaining teacher learning is equally crucial. And you may be wondering why do we have a picture of the ball, a, a ball here? Well, this is about not dropping the ball, not dropping the CPD ball, the continuing professional development ball. If under regular circumstances, when we are in a rush and when we are too busy, um, continuing professional development doesn't necessarily become a priority, then in, in cri critical situations like we still are, um, you know, it's very likely that continuing professional development will be uh, deprioritized or dropped altogether. Now, it's so important that it isn't. It's so important. Teachers have got much more to learn and they need the support of their line managers. They need the support of their organizations to set up those communities in which they can learn. 
So let's focus on teacher learning communities and trying to build them and sustain them. As I said, teacher learning is crucial and I think particularly now, learning together is even more important. And going back to Anna's um, ideas and opinions, she say she was uh, here. She was commenting on on a webinar that she attended, and she said, "I felt like it was a part of a team learning together, trying to get through the challenges that we are all facing. This thing that we are all in this together, um, in some way, is so important at this particular time." So I would say number one priority is to create, uh, of course, after we look at, you know, safeguarding um, and that everybody's safe, is to create opportunities for learning together safely. Now, together here, by together, I mean prioritizing synchronous teacher learning, i.e. teachers learning at the same time, in the same place, be it face-to-face -face in a socially distanced staff room or still virtually if that is your context. I am a great believer in asynchronous teacher learning. You know, I've been working online for a long, long time and I noticed that in normal circumstances, teachers learn really deeply when they can learn at their own time, in their own time, at their own pace, you know, they, they have more time to think, et cetera, et cetera. But because this is a critical time where togetherness really matters, that's what I'm saying now, it's really important to prioritize synchronous teacher learning. And this um, photo that I've taken, I took a couple of weeks ago, um, is a window of a place called Kettle's Yard, which is a kind of exhibition gallery here in Cambridge, where I'm based. And it challenges, you know, passers-by with this question, can physical distance bring us closer? And I do believe that it can, that it, we can actually work around those uh, problems, if you like, or limitations around uh, bonding and learning together. And to me, the most important question is not just can physical distance bring us closer together, but how can physical distance bring us closer together? This is a question that as academic managers and, and pro you know, the providers of continuing professional development do need to think about. So what can we do to recreate these spaces of togetherness, if you like, as meaningful professional encounters? And I do want to um, highlight this because teachers come together for meaningful activity. Uh, of course, we like yoga sessions and we like tea and cakes. Um, and it's great if schools provide that, but um, it's really important to understand that teachers come together to do something that they love, which is teach their students and get better and learn to get better as uh, you know at teaching their students and they, they're here to make a difference that's why i'm talking about meaningful professional encounters and my answer to this is as well as focusing on well-being etc is to focus on what really matters to teachers which is in terms of professional development transferable teacher learning. So what do I mean by transferable teacher learning? I mean teacher learning that can be transferred by the teachers themselves to their practice pretty much immediately. And a reminder, because in all this um, talk of well-being, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, sometimes we tend to forget that inspiration has an intellectual component. Uh, you know, teachers tell, told me I wanted to keep my brain active. I wanted to keep learning here. Um, so, what, uh, do, what are my suggestions? Number one, to create opportunities for finding solutions together. We are facing new challenges and we don't know, you know, we don't know whether we will have to revert to remote online teaching at some point, whether there's going to be a second lockdown, we don't know. So there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of unknowns, and a lot of things that we need to learn. Um, you know, the socially distanced classroom, forces us to rethink our practices. We can't do pair work, we can't do group work as we used to. We can't give the students fee uh, feedback very closely to them. So a lot of thinking about solutions to problems. And Doris Santoro says, whenever teachers are brought in to investigate, to find solutions and to develop interventions, you know, answers to problems, you're creating opportunities for authentic community, a community with a purpose that comes together to do something and taking action in a way that feels less isolating. So ideal, together. 
Second, create opportunities for sharing what works. This reminder from my colleagues that teachers are practitioners, mainly. They, they like to know practical stuff. They want to know how to get better at this, how that works, etc., etc. So, what are my what's my thinking around the do's and the don'ts of CPD continuing professional development during critical times? And yes, I do believe that these are still critical times. We haven't solved the pandemic. We might go into second lockdown, so we're still pretty much there. As I said before. The, the most important thing here is not to drop or to deprioritize continuing professional development. I know it's challenging. I know some um, schools have, have, have had to be reduced, so we have fewer teachers. We are busier as a result of that. Academic managers are busier, but it's so important that we do not deprioritize continuing professional development. This is probably less likely to happen, but just just to say, uh, you know, this is not the time to luxuriate in prolonged, um, you know, schemes like an extensive, I don't know, eight month action research project, over ambitious uh, CPD or time consuming or even costly or operationally complex. Right now, this is critical time. So we need to be focusing on short, sharp, frequent, focused, practical and relevant. This is our focus in CPD, at least that's how, um, I, what I believe. So here are two activities for continuing professional development that I believe are really appropriate for critical times. The first one I called the six Ds cycle, and the second one is the famous and old show and tell. So let me briefly talk uh, about each. So number one, the six cycle. This is my attempt to um, adapt, if you like, principles from, um, you know, the, the, the research literature around what works, what is impactful teacher learning, and it's all about teacher research. So how can we do short, sharp, focused, relevant and practical um, teacher research cycle? So again, with that focus, as we said before, on finding solutions to problems that we have and testing if they work in practice. So here is my cycle. It's, it's very simple. Um, so it is discover first, then I, uh, let me just, hang on, move the slide, that's it. Discover, decide, design, do, debrief and disseminate. So let's look at each stage very um, quickly. So number one, discover. So we have a problem of some kind. Think, for example, social distancing, a, a particular problem. So what could we try? And what's out there that might be useful for us? Once we do that discovery, we make a decision. Okay, so out of everything we've looked at, what are we going to try? Then we design the experiments, if you like. So who are we going to do it with? You know, um, which, which class, which students, when, for how long, how are we gonna go about it? And then we do it. We apply our uh, plan, our design into our activity. Then we debrief, that's your fifth D. So we ask ourselves, how well did it work? Is it worth developing even further? Is it, work, is it worth modifying in some way? Is it worth sharing more broadly with my colleagues? And if the answer to that is yes, then I move to disseminate, i.e. show and tell my colleagues about what I've tried. So this leads me nicely into show and tell. Show and tell is basically a very well-known technique for sharing what works with my colleagues. Um, and let me show you here an off the peg uh, framework that you can take very quickly, um, you know, and use in your staff room with your teachers in five minutes. So teacher saying, I've tried this activity, this technique, this tech, this app with my, they describe their class, because they explain the reason for why they have chosen that activity or technique, etc. This is how it works. So they, they, they talk about the procedure and if possible, they show the procedure. They explain how well it worked. So it worked really well, blah, blah, blah. Um, I recommend it because, so reasons to try it, and maybe um, they might want to um, add some suggestions for different classes, a variation on the procedure, something else they could do, etc. Now, show and tell can be used 
by, by itself. You don't have to do, um, you know, a six, uh, a six D cycle. Um, but what's important to understand here is that, uh, that that the focus here is on awareness. So, getting other teachers to become aware of this thing that I've I tried, this activity, etc., and with with the hope that it will inspire other teachers. It is the kind of activity that I was saying we should be doing. It's short, it's focused. Um, you know, a show and tell doesn't necessarily have to take more than five minutes. It's really practical because it's based on practice and it's relevant to teachers and their practice. And of course, it can be done frequently. You don't need a long CPD session for this. This can happen as one activity in the middle of a meeting um, and, and you can do it pretty much as often as you have meetings. So it could be done once a week, it could be done once a day. Very quickly, um, just for you to understand the difference in terms of which of the two activities is more impactful. So show and tell, as I said, is for awareness or inspiration, but you don't necessarily know that the other teachers that are listening to my show and tell will actually apply this to their own practice, whereas the 6D cycle is um, there's more depth of impact in the sense that teachers are actually applying what they're learning and hopefully uh, that is having a positive impact on their learners. So that's the difference. Okay, one more thing I'd like to say, um, um, what I, I, I think we should really be thinking carefully about moving on from what I call boot camp, uh, continuing professional development to building choice. If we think back of the days before lockdown, um, you know, we had to do what I would uh, describe as command and control CPD. You know, you, we had to teach teachers, you need to learn this because we're going to be using this. Very little room for discussion, very little room for consultation, if at all. That was the right thing to do then because we were in a rush, we had a lot of uh, ground to cover and we had no time. Now, this is six months ago. Um, and I really believe that we need to get back to choice and differentiated CPD because we need to remember that teachers as well as students are really different. And therefore, if we want to provide effective CPD, we need to think about ways, short, focused, practical, cheap, et cetera, but still that allow, um, you know, that provision of difference. Um, so, Opportunities for choice and difference in terms of topic and focus. And these two techniques that I've suggested, the 6D cycle offers that because each teacher might be working on a different technique or app or whatever, or a pair of teachers can be working on one and another pair on a different one. And the same can be said about show and tell. But beyond this, it's also important that we give opportunities for choice of format of CPD activities. So, for example, you could tell teachers to complete a poll for what they would like to see in their CPD program going forward. So this is an example of what you could suggest. So teachers choose whether they would like to have theme days, for example, Monday motivation, Tuesday teaching tips, Wednesday webinar recommendations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera or a monthly pre-recorded training session, or weekly get-togethers to build community, more about this in a second, or tweet meets. A tweet meet, uh, if you're not aware of that, is where all the teachers get together on Twitter and uh, through a hashtag, they answer a number of questions around a given topic. So if you want to explore this and you have never seen this before, um, you could have a look at ELT chat or um, ELT Ireland has got um, a, a tweet meet called Chinwag. So these are things that if you're interested or your teachers might be interested in exploring. Uh, get togethers, I said, you can do it as within your own organization. But um, there are also opportunities to do it more in, in a more extended manner with co colleagues beyond my school. So this is an example, for example, from IATEFL, uh, the International Association of Teachers of English as a Foreign Language um, and the Business English Special Interest Group that organizes something that they call the break room where teachers can relax and share and network. This is the equivalent of what I would call in face-to-face -face staff rooms, the water cooler moment where teachers just relax and have conversations. But teachers being teachers, they do talk about teaching and Learning, and that's sometimes where the most fascinating learning for teachers takes place. Finally, inspiration, of course, has got an emotional component as well. And it's really important not to underestimate how much 
a professional development session can do for the well emotional well-being of teachers. So here's an example of a colleague talking about an opportunity where he felt connected within our organization through a professional development activity. He's been uh, off work for five months, um, paid by the government, but he couldn't teach. So he joined a professional development um, event and he said, it was nice to be in, in a professional learning environment again, albeit not a physical one, and able to see some familiar faces. Obviously, it's not the same as the real thing, but it was a positive experience. And I came away, listen to this, feeling better about work, the organization and my place in it. This is Matt. And the same kind of, um, of feedback on a professional development um, session, this was a webinar organized for schools, not just within my organization, but for, the whole, for, for a number of schools here in the UK. And a participant tweeting after the webinar saying, how surprising that a webinar could help with a low mood. So a professional development activity where I engage my brain and learn with others and from others helps my low mood. Uh, I was connected with my community and I felt at home in that space. So I think it's an interesting um, thing that maybe we, if we talk a little less about how to feel better and we focus a little more on teaching and learning how well-being happens by being together and by learning together. So, um, to summarize then, let's focus on building those communities where teachers can come together in the same place, either virtual or uh, physical, to learn together, to learn from each other, um, to, to get busy thinking about how we can teach even better, and that will also provide support. Thank you. Time for questions now. Thanks very much, Silvana. That was hugely interesting. And I think a lot of the comments seem to echo uh, things you were saying. There was um, comments around how the sense of community is very challenging. Um, teachers felt alienated. And I think you're absolutely right. When the focus has been a lot on the importance of socialization for learners, it's been left a little bit out for teachers. And as you say, I think uh, learning communities and a CPD is a way of bringing that together. Now you've touched on um, different outcomes for different types of CPD mm -hmm. and one of the questions uh, comes back to that and asks what factors should you take into account when choosing CPD and how can you make the learning more effective? Yes. Thank you, Karen. <clears throat> there are so many different ways of answering that question because I would say, well, in normal circumstances, this. But this is critical times, but I, I don't think we should brush. Um, you know, uh, my answer is, is pretty much in the white paper that I co-wrote with, with uh, Gabriel diaz Majoli for Cambridge. And um, it's about, well, first of all, is, uh, you know, a factor that I need to consider is impact on learners, teachers really learn uh, effectively in their professional development activities if whatever you teach them is very linked to their learners and making learning better for their learners. So that means, again, what I said here, focus on practice, um, focus on, re make it relevant, um, make teachers link what they're learning in their CPD with their classrooms, get them to think they're not later, you know, don't just go, uh, we're learning about this and the research just says this, you know, a, a fundamental part of the professional development event has got to be the link between what they're learning in the session and the classroom. Um, and there are other factors, but I would say it's that relevance but also, as I said here, the importance of um, basing it on the concrete needs of those teachers in the contexts in which they work. You know, that it's really, really relevant to them and, and viable. Thanks. Um, another point which came up quite a few times, um, unfortunately, was that several teachers don't feel supported by their teaching institutions. So perhaps a related question is, if, if the school's not bringing up the, the opportunities to engage in teacher groups, um, a question is, are there any examples of communities for teachers you would recommend? Any online communities or, or blogs perhaps? 
Yes, absolutely. And I think that's fundamental. You know, when when you don't feel or, act, you know, it, it, it's clear that there is absolutely no support uh, for teacher development. Th this is when teachers do need to, I mean, teachers do anyway. Uh, there are teachers who are, uh, lots of teachers who care about their professional development, whether the organization provides it or not. So um, they need to take the development in their own hands. So as I said, uh, I think it's really, it's really important to look at um, teaching associations because they provide loads and loads of events. Uh, a lot of them are free. Um, some are not, but a lot of them are free. Um, joining networks, so, uh, you know, of, of um, special interest groups, for example, IATF or um, the national associations in different, um, you know, countries and regions are also really important. There's a lot of material online that's of very high quality. And sometimes, you know, as I said, tweet meets, um, um, joining these sessions but you can also generate your own you know if you're really interested in something that you want to explore you just set up a whatsapp group with the teachers that you know that might be interested in the same thing and then you say okay let's watch this video today or this webinar that we saw that's really relevant to this so let's read this paper this white paper or this blog post and let's get together on zoom I fill in the blanks, <laughs> you know, whatever, Zoom, Google Duo, or whatever, Teams, and let's have a 10 minute, 15 minute, whatever time you've got available to discuss, you know, how does this really apply to my context? Um, what can we do with this? Um, shall we try it together and then get back together in two weeks time and, and talk about how well it went? Um, so that would be a very easy way of, of generating. I think this is the time as well to um, for agency to say, okay, if they are not willing to provide it, then I am going to provide it to myself and for my colleagues in the way. And I think that that's a beauty of it all, that when it doesn't come top down, I've got total freedom to set up what I want in the way that I want to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've spoken to teachers who um, felt very isolated and then just through setting up informal groups, has made a huge difference feeling part of that community. And so I absolutely agree that agency, say, taking it into your own control is, is a great and easy way of doing it. Um, got another question here that sort of links back to well-being and how can we promote well-being through CPD? The short answer is uh, to approach it as a topic. So uh, there are loads of uh, writers and sessions and webinars and books. There's a new book, for example, that um, Sarah Mercer um, and another colleague have just written on, on teacher well-being. So you can, you can deal with it as a topic. Um, you can bring in a coach um, to, to share, uh, for example, you know, coaching um, techniques. Um, there are also uh, a personal and professional learning networks. So, for example, I am part of one that's uh, for school leaders, um, and it's a Facebook group. Um, so uh, things happen there to promote well-being. Um, so there are many ways in which you can do it, but I think I will repeat what I said in my session. It's more important to walk the walk than to talk the talk. You can talk a lot about well-being, but if you're not promoting continuing professional development, giving teachers time and space to learn in a safe way together, if you're not valuing them, uh, if you're not uh, actually supporting uh, the, you know, if they're burnt out, what are you doing about their burnt out? That's walking the well-being walk. If that doesn't happen and we talk a lot about well-being, that really has very little, makes very little sense. I think it's about being serious about well-being as an organization and actually promoting it in the, the policies, but mainly in the practices, in the way we give people time and space for their well-being as teachers and, pu and people. Thanks, Silvana. And there was another question about, um, and I think it'd be, may, may be interesting to sort of hear the, about the connection again about some, should we focus on the psychological well-being of teachers rather than CPD? So I think the interesting thing is is making the connection between those two. If you'd like to comment on that. Uh, Savannah. Yes, there's a lot written on, on the psychological well-being of teachers. Um, and it's not very different from the well-being of any other professional. I think uh, there are issues around uh, being at, I, I was just reading recently again, um, 
there's a little bit of secondary trauma at the moment, which is, um, or it's called, com uh, com I think it's called, I don't remember the exact term, but it's about being compassionate and empathetic. So when you are very close to students who have had traumatic circumstances, like for example, um, you know, COVID in the family, bereavement, or pe parents losing their jobs, you know, really traumatic situations, that teachers kind of by contagion become also traumatized. So that, that should be definitely addressed. Um, but yeah, and, and then there's also the dimension of having had to do or still doing the job from home uh, while, you know, keeping the, everything else going with all the disruptions that take place when you learn, and sorry, when you work from home. So that's all very well written and documented. Um, some for me is much more about understanding it myself as a provider of CPD and acting it out in my practice rather than talking about it a lot. I, I, I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about it or we shouldn't learn about it. But for me, when, as I said, when we talk about it and we do not follow through with our own attitudes, behaviors, organizational policies and systems, then that breeds cynicism. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of things to take away there, um, but really, it, really important stuff on the value of getting together as communities and continuing our CPD. So thank you very much for a very interesting talk, Silvana. Thank you very much for having me, Karen. <laughs>